Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name's Paul Ryan. I'm from the Australian Resilience Centre. I'm going to be the facilitator presenter of this session. Um, uh, a warm welcome to people joining us for the first event. Welcome back to, to people that, um, um, that have been with us for the, one of the last two sessions. So. If I can just ask as people join, if you switch off your video uh, and go on to mute. Um, and I'll just remind people that we're also recording these sessions. And so if you if you um, have an issue with that, now's your opportunity to dive out, just you know, to make you aware that um, we will be recording these and putting them up on the um, Gold and Broken Catchment Management Authority's website. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to hand over to Ashley Rogers from the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority to welcome us all here in acknowledgement of country. So over to you, Ash. Thanks, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining in on our third session. So um, we've had almost 200 people now register for this webinar series. So I will be recapping a few acknowledgements that those that have um, watch the recordings or participate the last couple of weeks have heard me, but um, just so everyone's on the same page. Um, the Gone Broken CMA is really um, pleased to be working with Paul and the Australian Resilience Centre to bring you this uh, webinar series. We were originally planning some workshops and we've adapted with COVID to um, a webinar series. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Golden Broken catchment, the Tangarong and Yorta Yorta people, as well as the traditional owners of the lands from where you're all joining from today and their unique connection to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the Victorian governments, our catchments, our communities program and the Golden Broken CMA for sponsoring this webinar series. You might be wondering why is the Golden Broken CMA um, interested in resilience? Um, we've been working in this space since 2005 um, using resilience principles and thinking to guide our strategic planning and approach to natural resource management. Um, we'll be talking more about it in the fifth webinar series but um, we're currently renewing the regional catchment strategy which guides um, natural resource management um, activities to improve and protect our resources so the water land biodiversity um, because as you all most likely know, um, looking after these precious natural resources underpins the social, cultural and economic well-being of the diverse catchments that diverse communities that make up the catchment. Uh, so these six year strategy we renew every six years um, and resilience thinking really underpins that strategy. So um, it allows us to focus on connections between people and nature and plan for uncertainty and change. Um, the strategy is not just about the CMA, but all groups, organisations, landholders that um, are involved in natural resource management. So we'll be working with all of these um, stakeholders, which no doubt includes a lot um, of you joining today to um, co-design the new strategy. We also strongly uh, support building the capacity of individuals in the catchment to understand and apply resilience thinking. So. That's, an, I guess, a key reason why we're also um, supporting this webinar series. So that's all from me. Um, I'll hand back over to you, Paul. Thanks. Thanks, Ash. And um, what we're going to do now is to dive into some content. We um, this is going to be a fairly full session. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of stuff to get through. So we'll have we'll we'll try to have some time towards the end for some questions. Um, as we have done each week, um, we, we're scheduled to finish at 10.45, but I'll hang around and be online and Ash will as well up until about 11 o'clock if people have got any, um, you know, more kind of comments, questions, informal things uh, after the session. So we started our journey, this, this webinar series, by looking at um, some definitions and we, we talked about the difference between uh, um, resilience at the sort of personal, psychological, personal level. Then we started to focus in on um, at the talked about the community level. We talked about disaster resilience, and then we talked about this social ecological resilience, the connection between people and place, this system level resilience, and that's where we're focusing, and that's where the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority um, have focused and are focusing their work through the catchment 
strategy renewal process. Um, we then last week we we honed in on that uh, social ecological resilience and we we focused in on that. And this week I'm going to go a little bit further with that and start to talk about this kind of idea of the resilience process that we just touched on towards the end last week. And then we talked a little bit about principles and I'm really going to spend most of the time this week talking about those principles and then we'll touch on practice, which is the, the detail that we'll get into uh, next week. So when we think about a resilience, um, when we think about resilience as a process, I, I put up this diagram last week, which is sort of four blocks or chunks of, of uh, work or thinking that you need to go through when you're trying to apply uh, resilience uh, concepts and practice. And the first one was this key idea about um, developing a systems view. As I said, we took focused on social ecological systems um, and that brings with it particular ways of looking at problems. <clears throat> and I, I put up this image of the northeast um, and I talked about this idea of really trying to take a, a systems view to understand the underlying fabric. How is the system organised? What's So not being distracted by the patterns, if you like, that overlay um, the world around us, you know, the towns, the infrastructure, the, the um, you know, the landscape, the shape of the landscape, not being distracted by the sort of colour and movement of that, but trying to look underneath to see how the social, environmental and economic systems are interwoven. And so this idea of the kind of underlying fabric and using a systems perspective to look at that. We then talked about this idea of system change and, and how systems change over time. And I put up this diagram and I talked about the difference between sort of anticipated and unanticipated change. So things that we can anticipate might happen in the future and things that um, surprise us. And we also highlighted this, the difference between sort of things that are kind of what I call destructive, the impact of those things that they have a negative impact on things that we care about, but also trying to push towards this idea of, of seeing the opportunities that, that occur when we have um, different you know, impacts on us or different shocks and stresses. And so trying to sort of position ourselves more in the centre of this rather than um, in the bottom left hand corner, which is where we tend to spend a lot of time with our thinking about um, the future and the world around us. We then touched on this idea of critical resilience attributes, these um, the ability to to look at a stress and to see the kind of shape of that stress, the, the curve of it, how um, stress increases as we get to the sort of peak of a crisis. And these critical attributes down here, this the ability to anticipate, absorb, respond, recover, and then this renewal phase um, following from any shock or stress. And we talked about the importance of those critical resilience capacities in helping us to, to deal with, um, you know, the, the uh, stress that a shock or a crisis can bring. And then finally, we talked about coping strategies, and this is these are not psychological coping strategies. These are kind of the, the the tactics, if you like, the strategy that you'd employ between trying to persist. So, are we just trying to survive? So, do we want to, you know, go through that curve, if you like, and just come out the other side and be exactly the same, or are we thinking about the need to adapt, to change um, our strategy so that we can cope better with those things in the future, or are we thinking about a fundamental transformation, a, a shift in the identity of, of ourselves or our business or, or our landscape or our community or whatever it might be. And so we talked about those different um, kind of strategies that we could deploy or, or have in place to, to think about how we want to manage um, as we go through those shocks and stresses, but also as we come out the other side of them to think about where do we want to go in the future. So those, those four kind of chunks, if you like, come together to help us to think about resilience uh, and to plan and manage for uh, the way we um, operate in the world. There's some challenges, of course, and, you know, the first obvious challenge is when we're thinking about the kind of threads that tie the system together is, um, uh, you know, do we understand the, the, the way that's woven together? Do we really understand the relationship between 
society, the economy, um, and and people and ecosystems and how they all intertwine. What if we're trying to pull on the wrong thread? Um, what if we we are pulling on a thread that makes the you know the the fabric come undone or or pulls a knot into the fabric if you if you um, if you like. And we see this all the time in a lot of government policy where it might have a fairly narrow focus. They're pulling on one of the threads. Um, but in fact, there's a whole lot of unintended consequences that, that you don't see happening. But when you're sort of pulling on one thread in a in a fabric, you might be unstitching a whole lot of things. When we think about that idea of change, it's not just change now, but in fact, there's change, the legacy and the lags from past change. Think of legacies as scars, if you like, from past impacts um, that people carry both you know, psychologically, but we see them in the landscape as well. We can see this, the, the fire scars in the landscape. Um, there are lags, there are time lags. So there's examples of environmental weeds that have sat dormant in the landscape for 70 and 80 years um, until the right environmental conditions come along, a wet season or a, a, um, a particular flood or a you know dry spell or whatever it might be that kicks off those weeds and they take off. So they were sitting there um, and we didn't see the full effect of that until uh, conditions change. And then there's this idea of emergence that um, in systems that when conditions change um, uh, and you might see something that um, suddenly um, combines in another way with, with some other new dynamic in the system or something that's happening in the system, and so you get new phenomena starting to emerge. So we have not just now, but we've got a past. Every system has a past and all of the things that are built in that we carry forward from that past and a future. When we look at those stress curves down the bottom there, there's not just a single stress curve. We're never dealing with a single event. We're always um, in recovery and we're always experiencing, experiencing a new event. And so look at, you know, the, the example for all of us here, particularly in the northeast of Victoria at the moment, is um, you know obviously people recovering from fire, and now we've got the COVID pandemic over the top. We're often you know seeing economic um, impacts, and and then you'll see a, a an ecological impact or a natural disaster shock over the top, and then there's a long tail of recovery both in terms of the natural system, but also in the ecological system. So we have this layering. Uh, of effects and we have these sequencing of effects and so we're never dealing just with one one of these in isolation. And then finally, um, when we're thinking about what's the coping strategy, um, you know, even internally for us as individuals, but as a society, um, there's always tension between the, the strategy to persist, the strategy to keep things the same and the strategy to change. And, you know, all Western democracies around the world have this tension built in that, you know, um, essentially, um, you know, progressive and, and um, conservative politics, if you like, is, is a sort of tension between those two um, extreme ends of those strategies <clears throat> in terms of persisting right through to transformation. So that can lead to a lot of, um, you know, challenges in how we think about the system. It can lead to a lot of uncertainty, dealing with a lot of uncertainty. We're loaded, a lot of our systems are loaded with uncertainty about how they behave, about how um, they'll behave and the way we respond and the way um, interventions that we might make and how they'll um, play out in the system and get a lot of unintended consequences. <clears throat> and I touched on last week this idea of these resilient design principles, and that's where the, that's why these um, principles are so important. <clears throat> Excuse me. These design principles, if you like, are a kind of foundation or a backstop that can help us deal with the problems I just outlined: the the uncertainty, the the um, you know the tension in the system about what's the right strategy, the fact that we're dealing with past events that we don't fully understand how they're impacting on us now the legacy of those, um, as well as, you know, dealing with multiple events and we don't really know how these things play out. Resilient design principles can help us to do that and that's where I want to spend most of the time today. So I'm going to dive into these principles. There are principles or we call them imperatives, eight imperatives that must underpin any interventions to build and strengthen resilience. They provide a foundation on which to build more resilient systems and they provide a safety net for when our understanding or our actions fall short. So think of these as, if you like, just 
um, there as the, the the safety net for when our you know lack of understanding of the uncertainty of a system and how it's going to work or how an intervention or an action we take in it might work. So there's eight of these principles. They've come out of a long history of, of work um, by resilience um, practitioners and academics around the world. They've been tested and refined and we've taken them and tested them and refined them in different ways here um, and, and sort of honed them down to a set. And we keep working at that. We were, you know, I was messing around with language yesterday just to try and hone these down to get the most powerful kind of expression and language of them. So they're not fixed in stone, but they're, um, their, their basis, their origins are very solid. The first one, and we've talked a lot about this already, is about adopting a systems perspective or a complexity perspective. And I touched a little bit on the idea of the fact that complexity thinking um, is embedded here when we talk about systems. So we need to adopt a systems perspective to appreciate the interdependencies between social, environmental and economic factors. Um, you know, it goes without saying, humans are, um, are totally dependent on ecosystems, our, all our wealth, uh, all of our life sustaining um, services that come from from e that come from ecosystems. How we interact and how the social system, environmental and economic systems interact is you know complex. Um, the the diagram on the right there is um, comes from Kate Rayworth and and colleagues at Stockholm Resilience Centre that this idea of the donut where there's a kind of the light green areas is safe and just space for humanity. On the outside are a set of what are called planetary boundaries. These are environmental limits that you know society and, and um, humanity needs to stay within, and they relate to biophysical processes about land use change, climate change, um, fresh water, um, uh, biodiversity loss, etc. On the inside are a set of social uh, limits, if you like, social boundaries, and they relate to access to food and water and income, education, resilience. Um, you know, a voice, uh, jobs, energy, equity, gender equity and health. And the idea here is that they form a kind of, you know, the limits, the upper and lower limits, if you like. And, and between that, if humanity can operate within that, it's a safe and just space for humanity and it's sustainable. We need a complexity perspective to understand that safe operating space. The second principle is around governance and leadership and um, having approaches that enable people and institutions to prepare for and respond to and learn from change. So this is about the way we think about the world and how we enact that in terms of our institutions, our governance and leadership. And um, if you look at the, the four people on the, the screen here, um, you know, people that have prided themselves on being sort of decisive and macho and, and um, you know, making decisions and yet their, their inability to understand the threat of COVID, their inability to act decisively and prepare and to listen to the science and advice has put a lot of lives in danger and caused a lot of unnecessary um, pain and suffering. And you contrast that with other leaders around the world that have acted so decisively with anticipation, but they've also acted with empathy and compassion for their um, uh, countrymen and women, uh, and the difference, you know, is is stark. And and but a lot of it is around the ability to understand system change, to un, to to prepare adequately, um, and to learn from the past. And if anyone, if you haven't seen Angela Merkel's or read Ang the transcript of Angela Merkel's, one of the speeches she gave early on around COVID, it's really worth going back and chasing that out. It's a it's um. Uh, profound, quite a profound um, speech from a leader. So we need um, approaches for making decisions as as groups of people, whether that's at the international level, whether it's at the national level, whether it's at the state, whether it's at our local um, in local government or at the local community, um, our land care group, with it, or within our own family about um, being able to make decisions in these situations of uncertainty. Um, make decisions that help us to prepare, to anticipate what could happen, prepare for events, to respond to those and to learn from change. Um, and we've seen, you know, the impact of decision making right down at the individual level and how um, in bushfire situations, for example, that the way people make decisions can be critical in terms of um, their ability to survive. 
The third principle is around this idea of building and um, build and support self-organisation capacities. The ability to self-organise is a fundamentally important resilience capacity and strategy. Um, uh, and so you need to, that capacity to prepare and recover from shocks and stresses, but also to capitalise on opportunities and be less resilient on external support. And we've seen this in spades through the bushfire crisis over the last, um, you know, over the summer, but also we've seen it through COVID. Communities just self-organising and having the skills and capacity to um, organise to, to make decisions together relating back to that previous principle about um, adaptive governance and decision making and leadership. So the ability to come together as a community or as a group of people, have the capacities to, to be organised, to prepare, um, to you know, deal with shocks, but also to capitalise on opportunities. And, and we see this again and again, and it fascinates me having worked with a lot of small communities around Australia, some communities have this capacity, they have the ability to just come together and other communities, you know, just down the road will sit there and, and wait for someone else to come. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the way the increase in, in um, the shocks and stresses on our society, on our communities, means government can't be everywhere. Government will do what it can do and they do it well when we hit that kind of crisis peak, but they will also leave. Um, and again, you know, working with communities that are in recovery, you see this that when all of the kind of um, government services and things start to move away, the emergency service response is kind of over and you move into this recovery mode, that's when this um, capacity to self-organise really comes to the fore. Principle four is around designing for flexibility. And so it's really about um, designed for flexibility to enable deliberate adaptation and transformation and avoid the costs of rigid systems that become brittle and prone to failure over time. And um, this is something, you know, we can think of infrastructure examples. So the, you know, the example on the left there is the, um, you know, really simple uh, flexibility strategy. Roads are, are, you know, expensive to build. They're difficult to, to, to widen because of the fact that, you know, um, suburbs and and um, private property come right up to about right up to the to the boundaries of roads and so just the really simple idea of using um, these you know flexibility in terms of lanes and that sort of stuff is one way that even within a relatively rigid system you can build in a lot of flexibility um, to meet the changing demands between morning and afternoon peaks etc in traffic on the right there is um, uh, an image of the uh, upgrade to the irrigation infrastructure in in around Shepparton and in the Golden Murray Irrigation District, and um, as around two billion dollars worth of investment to upgrade the irrigation system, um, done for all the right reasons. But um, it's still, you know, still that project is still underway now. But in even in the time that the system was being built, um, in a backdrop of a twenty percent. Uh, or oh, sorry, a halving of the um, inflows into the Murray-Darling Basin um, and a reduction in the availability of, of irrigation water, changes in land use, changes in demographics, changes in commodity prices, all sorts of things. We've seen the system move on quite rapidly, land use changes as, as, as happened quite rapidly, and yet um, a system that, uh, of infrastructure that's been built um, that is relatively inflexible. And so you've got this mismatch between an inflexible, fairly rigid system um, and a really dynamic landscape around it. And so, um, you know, ultimately over time that puts you out of sync. So some of the infrastructure is obviously, um, get, is, is going to be left kind of stranded, if you like, while the landscape moves on to other things. And so thinking about flexibility, about building flexibility into any decisions, um, I've talked about infrastructure here, but the same thing applies in terms of thinking about strategies. The same thing applies in terms of thinking about the way we run processes. You know, the fact that we're, um, as Ash mentioned, Ash mentioned, we were going to do these um, uh, workshops face to face, and you know, we shifted to an online delivery. Um, having the ability to to be flexible is an absolutely fundamental resilience strategy.
Principle five is around managing connectivity within and between systems. Um, and that allows the flow of essential elements. And we know that it's critical to have, for example, in ecosystems, we know that, you know, river systems need to be um, connected to allow, um, you know, the migration and movement of fish up and down and passage of fish up and down river systems and other aquatic organisms. We know that in natural systems that, um, you know, patches of vegetation need to be connected to allow the flow of genetic material um, to allow species to move through the landscape to connect, collect resources. But we also know in um, social systems, um, in economic systems, um, in you know power systems and power structures in organisations, all of those sorts of things in communication networks, that we need you know connectivity to allow us to to access the things we need. And you know all of us that live in rural um, areas know how you know fundamentally important just things like connectivity in communication is. But we also need to balance that against the potential risks of overconnectivity and how that can allow undesirable contagions to spread, um, reasonably topical at the moment. Obviously, you know, COVID spread much faster than um, the similar kind of contagions in the past. The Spanish flu took, um, you know, seven to 10 years to spread. COVID takes um, a, a matter of months to spread over the whole world. You can also have undesirable contagions in, in other ways. The photo on the left was a, a an image or an, an image that was circulating on Twitter and Facebook um, that, you know, reportedly was about the spread of COVID, um, you know, in the first few months after it emerged. It is, in fact, the the shows the airline routes, um, global airline routes that were mapped in 2010. Someone just picked it up and used it, whether maliciously or not, picked it up and used it, and it spread wild, widely and wildly around, um, you know, through social media and create a lot of fear and panic and people thinking that, you know, this thing is zooming all over the place when in fact it was a fairly kind of staged and predictable kind of spread. On the right is a, a social network map from a, a town called um, Framingham in the, in the US. It's a famous um, town, a relatively small rural town, but it's been studied now for a long period of time through a, a, a range of different lenses, particularly looking at health. But these researchers were actually looking at this social network and looking at um, how a range of things move through that social network. Um, this one, this image, the yellow dots represent people that are overweight, the green dots represent people that are um, within a healthy weight range. And what you see is that actually um, obesity clusters in the in the system and over, overweight and, and obesity class people uh, cluster um, and they map the same things for things, emotions like happiness, for depression. Um, the same researchers have, have looked at smoking, they've looked at smiling in social networks. And what you see is these things um, moving through the system. So it's not people moving, it's not the people moving to cluster together, it's the contagion, these issues moving. So the emo it's the emotion moving or the, um, you know, the health outcome that's moving in the system. So um, and there's, there's a whole range of kind of things there around um, the ability for people to make change in their social networks, like if you're trying to quit smoking, if you're surrounded by other smokers and all of those sorts of things, and those contagions move out for a number of um, uh, degrees of separation, and in some cases up to three degrees of separation were being influenced by the contagions in those networks. So keeping people connected, um, but also... Um, and keeping systems connected, but also being very aware of the, the potential downsides of connectivity. Principle six, we've talked a lot about this already, but is to have this, this as a kind of core idea that we're not just talking about valuing and retaining this critical these re critical resilience capacities for particular events like, you know, bushfire or flood but also just trying to build them in to the wider system and being aware all of the time that we always need to be having the capacity, building and retaining that capacity to anticipate, to absorb, to respond, to recover and renew. Um, and that, if you like, attention to those sort of capacities um, and system awareness, system literacy we talk about um, and being aware of how, you know, prepared you are about how things move through systems, all of those 
are capacities that are generally um, valuable because you don't know what the future shocks might be. So just retaining those, valuing those, retaining them and building them is a, is a core resilience, resilience principle. Seven, principle seven is around um, orientating towards the most influential dynamics in systems. And um, in particular, there's three uh, that we focus on. One is around slow changing variables. Slow changing variables, slow changes are the kind of prime movers in systems. They're the things that grind you to the edge. They don't necessarily push you over, but they grind you to the edge. It's these other two um, more rapid or faster moving kind of dynamics, tipping points, so getting to the edge and then suddenly a small push can push you over the edge, that's a tipping point, or a leverage point where a small intervention can have a big effect. They're much faster, um, and they work in, in concert, if you like, with those slow changing variables, but they're the, the dynamics that fundamentally shape and change systems over time and lead to the slow change grinding you to the edge, then a small change can put you over the edge, the tipping point. And we've seen this in climate, you know, we've seen all the thresholds around 400 parts per million and all of these kind of things where, um, you know, below that level, the system will continue to function and operate in a particular way, but above that level, we'll see um, more dramatic changes. And that's why there's so much focus on um, thinking about, you know, emissions at certain levels and trying to keep uh, the system to within two degrees of warming, which, you know, we go over that and that becomes a tipping point where we see a whole lot of feedbacks kick in that become self-reinforcing. So we get a sort of runaway ball rolling down the hill kind of, um, outcome. We can see a lot of those in natural systems and, and there's a, a database, an online database of those tipping points in natural systems and the shifts that occur, the regime shifts they're called. But So we see lots of those in natural systems, but we also see them in social systems. And so, um, you know, in crowd behaviour, if you get a certain number of people behaving badly in a crowd, um, it'll, it'll be isolated. But once you go over a certain level, um, that behaviour can spread and suddenly you get a riot, you know, that's the extreme example. But we can see that again in social media networks, we can see it in the in fads, the adoption of particular, um, you know, whether it's fashion trends or whether it's, you know, um, online media crazes, all sorts of things that get to some point and then they start to take off. That's That's this dynamic of tipping points and the feedbacks that kick in. Understanding those and what we talk about as orientating towards those is a really fundamental kind of resilience um, approach and one of the key principles because it helps you to sort through the messiness. It helps you to navigate some of that messiness, some of that complexity, you know, the, the, the ball of string, the, the messiness of all of the wool. Um, this helps you to, to think about what to focus in on. And in any system, there tends to only be a few key variables, a small number. And we talk about a rule of hand that there's maybe four or five key shaping variables that are changing that you really need to focus in on. The last one is um, this principle of deliberately learning for change to create the future that we want. So all of us, anyone who, you know, works in any kind of agency capacity or has government money, you know, is well aware of the kind of requirement for monitoring evaluation type stuff and this focus on, um, you know, collecting data and information to, to sort of learn from what we've done. In reality, most of that monitoring and evaluation type stuff doesn't really help us learn much about the system. It tends to just tell us, you know, did we, did we achieve the objective that we set out to achieve, yes or no, that's valuable at a certain level, but it doesn't really help us to um, think about creating change. It tends to keep us in that persistence mode or mindset. And there's a concept called triple loop learning, which is, which is about going to deeper levels of learning. So instead of just saying, did we achieve our objectives? It actually asks the question, well, were the objectives the right objective? So that's the kind of second level where you're starting to question um, that deeper level of, you know, how did we do this? Why did we do it? And then there is a third deeper level, which is like, 
How did we set those objectives? Who was involved in setting those objectives? Were we using the right um, ideas to think about this problem? Are there alternative ways we could look at it? Are there alternative knowledge systems like traditional knowledge or ex other forms of expert knowledge or other forms of um, local knowledge that we could bring together? And so it forces you to question, if you like, the kind of paradigm, the way you're thinking about the problem. And that's where you start to get this real change. To do that, we need to get off that kind of short cycle of just, um, you know, kind of, did we do the project? Yes, tick, um, tick a box and move on. But actually to start to sort of step back and do some deeper questioning. In terms of um, how we learn about system change, it can be incredibly valuable and the, the photo here is from um, uh, Cyclone Larry from, I think it was 2006 in Queensland, a devastating cyclone that, you know, had a massive impact on some communities up there. Some of the local communities up there um, off their own bats um, got together and, and did a, a, a kind of a reflection, if you like, and they did some really simple things. They asked people questions like, um, what was valuable to you in the period immediately after the cyclone, what helped what helped you in your daily life in that recovery? And out of that came a whole lot of advice. There's some great reports around out of it called one particularly called Lessons from Larry, um, but there's a range of kind of learnings from it. And they those learnings have been so powerful that they've shaped, in fact, a lot of resilience, disaster resilience thinking around the whole country. So um, when you heard Anna Bly, you know, further down the track talking about um, potential flooding in Queensland and saying to people, you need to get 300 bucks cash out of the ATM. You need an inverter to plug into your car so that you can charge your phone and get your laptop up and running. Those things came from those immediate lessons um, following that cyclone. And so the real value, that real power in reflecting and learning quickly after events and then using that information to help inform future events. So they're the eight, uh, these imperatives, these eight principles that we can think about that underpin the way um, we, we do our work in resilience. So I, I talked about these, these boxes, you know, this taking a, a systems view, thinking about how systems change, thinking about these critical resilience capacities and how we respond to any individual event and, and then what is the strategies that we've got in the longer term for moving forward. Um, those things are really relevant when we're dealing with known problems, when we're responding to known issues, but those resilience principles actually underpin and help us to cope and deal with that uncertainty when we're dealing with lots of unknowns. So. Um, we can do this in a process. We can we can work through these kind of steps in a process, and um, each of these steps uh, <clears throat> has some tools associated with it. And next week, what I want to do is to hone in on the set of tools, um, and particularly um, the way we can use those tools to help explore and understand issues. Um, this is you know examples from that I'll use from next week from work that we're we're doing. Uh, in New South Wales, and that will soon be um, uh, repeating here in Northeast Victoria in partnership with the primary care partnerships. Um, these these tools that have been used, and we've used them in lots of different settings and different contexts. This is with a, um, a, a community in South Africa that dealing with um, wildlife poaching and and um, and incursions by wildlife out of national parks that into um, livestock areas and things like that. Um, we'll we'll talk about some of those tools and some of the kind of practices. Um, I'll explain why Milo and and Bundaberg Rum and Great Northern Beer is important, and then <clears throat> um, some of the tools that you can use to think about intervening in systems and using those ideas of leverage and tipping points um, about designing your strategies in your way forward. And in particular, I'll hone in on this. Um, idea of local community resilience networks and and their importance in in helping to bring together all of the the concepts that we've talked about in the last three weeks. Next week we'll hone in. It'll just be a case study, if you like, around this idea of local community resilience networks, uh, and that'll be the focus. Okay, so I'm conscious that's 40 minutes of a lot of stuff. Um, 
and we're getting close to wrap up time. I'm just wondering if there's any comments, any questions, any reflections on on what I've pres presented. I know I've just thrown a lot of stuff at you, but I'll hand over to any comments, questions. So if people can type them in the chat function if you have that capacity. Otherwise, um, feel free to turn your audio on and chime in or send me an email. Thanks. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for reminding me of that. So if people have comments or questions or if they have some some follow up, I, I wanted to comment from um, or something I wanted to comment from last week and and someone um, who's responded to the survey that we did in the first two weeks has asked about this link between sort of resilience, particularly of children and of system resilience and that what's the link and how do we particularly how do we think about building <clears throat> resilience in children? Um, you know, I'm not a I'm not a psychologist, um, and I don't spend a lot of time focusing on psychological resilience. And there's a huge number of resources available online around childhood psychology and resilience, <clears throat> and it's an area that's you know rapidly expanding and growing. What I will say from my perspective is thinking about at the systems level, what we know is that um, significant events have um, uh, really um, major impacts on on people and particularly on children and those those um, events can leave a legacy that lasts a very long time and we've seen that with in the Black Saturday cohort of kids um, you know their their NAPLAN scores lag behind a, a decade later there's higher prevalence of um, uh, mental illness in kids that were exposed to um, the events of Black Saturday. And so all I would say is um, that the, the challenge I think is <clears throat> is to think about systems and, and the events and the impacts that they will we experience that we can't avoid, the shocks and stresses we can't avoid, but being very aware that there are people within those communities, within those systems that are more vulnerable. Kids are one, um, people for a whole range of other reasons that are vulnerable because of pre-existing mental health issues, or people that are vulnerable because they're socially isolated or because they don't have resources. Um, and we always need to think about from a system perspective that not everyone is gonna be able to cope and respond. And that will be different for different people um, and different stresses. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so just a couple of questions. Um, uh, so, from Shuan, um, with the eight principles, do you run through them in a linear way or do you work through them all together at the same time? <clears throat> um, good, good question. And and the way the way we've been doing it, Shuan, is to is to um, get people to think about them, to assess them in in a kind of linear fashion. But but the reality is um, there is no there's no order there. The one to eight, they're not necessarily in priority order. I put the the thinking ones, if you like, first, and more of the doing ones later. <clears throat> but they're not necessarily a linear set. So, um, you know, and you might you might decide that the focus for a particular area is just on building flexibility, or the focus is on thinking about connectivity. <clears throat> you need to be cognizant of the others, but you might have a priority focusing on on some of those because that's where you think it's weak. So there's no kind of internal um, linear logic there from the one to eight. Um, I just tend to split them that way because I think it just makes more sense. Um, Kirsty, does the complexity of these principles stop people from actually making change? Sometimes I feel like there is um, so much to think about, it's hard to take the first step. Yep, that's absolutely true. Kirsty, what the way, you know, that of course it can feel like sort of paralysis if you like. How do we manage all of these eight things as well as deal with the crisis? What we've tried to do is to think about, you have to deal with the thing that's in front of your face, you know, the, the kind of most immediate challenges, but to use those principles as backups. <clears throat> so as almost like checks. Um, so you can use them to think about 
when you make decisions. You can use them to think about when you're designing something and you can use them to think about when you're evaluating something, how well did this work? So using them like a sort of checklist or a, a kind of um, a prompting list. So you've still got to deal with the crisis. You've still got to deal with the thing that you're dealing with. But having those sitting behind, this set of principles sitting behind to fall back on. Um, and there's times when, you know, you might just want to focus on the principles because you you don't know, you're not confident about the future. You've got high uncertainty or you're not sure what's going to happen in the future. You might think, well, the best strategy is just to build, use these principles and focus more on those. <clears throat> um, and thanks, Catherine. Yeah, really good um, reference there to Emerging Minds has a lot of really good resources for childhood resilience. Uh, lots of stuff on the web. The Resilience Project has um, has got a lot of um, stuff that you can draw on that really, um, and they do a lot of work in schools. <clears throat> um, so lots of stuff out there in terms of thinking about childhood resilience. <clears throat> Uh, a comment and question or question from Helen McGowan. For me, the guiding principle is embracing change. It's the Zen Cohen. Essentially, it is a reframe that we need to make it as up as we go whilst remaining confident that we can discover the emerging pathway. I'd agree, Helen, and I think it's a real tension with this, you know, the kind of need for certainty. Governments um, want to give people certainty. They want to seem like they're in control. A lot of leaders within government want to give the impression that they're in control, um, uh, you know, right down to within your own life or within your own family or your own business. But as in uncertainty increases, um, as the challenges of a, you know, more inter interconnected world kind of impact on us, that actually building these skills to just embrace change, embrace uncertainty, <clears throat> um, and to also just acknowledge it and to admit that, that we don't know what's going to happen next. And, you know, that's the kind of approach I've started to take much more with my own work is to just sort of go, well, I'm not sure, actually, you know, let's try something and see. And I think being confident to do that, but also, um, you know, being open enough to it and admitting that you don't know is really fundamentally important too. So having that um, confidence to to admit you don't know what the right thing to do next, that's okay. And but having strategies in place to help you to navigate through, so that you feel um, like you you've got a plan. You don't want to go into the world without a plan, um, without a plan about you know the way forward. But it can be a different type of plan. It can be a plan to learn. It can be a plan to experiment. It can be a plan to be vigilant, to try to learn from the system and to look for those early indicators that tell you about system change and that you might need to change strategy, et cetera. So, yeah, I agree, Helen. Good, good comment. Thanks for that. Any other comments or questions? Anything else people want to add before we, we wrap up and, um, and pull the plug? Uh, next week, as I say, we'll focus in just essentially on a case study of a community, local community resilience networks. Um, and uh, I'll just talk about the tools, the practices, um, and so it'll be much more kind of um, less uh, kind of theoretical, less concept based and much more practice based. So we'll hone in. And then in week five, we'll come down to talking about the Goulburn Broken Catchments um, Catchment Management Authority's regional catchment strategy and about the approach and how they're using resilience at the catchment scale and in their work uh, and how they're using resilience thinking to guide the renewal of that strategy um, as well as other work that happens in the catchment. So that'll be the focus in week five. So that's the kind of journey that we're on. Okay, so unless there's any other comments or questions, we, we might um, pull it to a close. And everyone, I'll upload the recording later today or tomorrow um, to our website. So that'll be at the same location as the others, but I'll email out the link again if you want to share it with your networks um, that might be interested in this. Um, yeah. Great. Good on you. Thanks, Ash. No worries. All right. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks, folks. Thank you.